long, long ago, there lived a woman who became a legend. These are all the choices. We have Scarlet Waves, Golden Glory. You know what? You want to be as factual as possible. Let's go! Is this the Guinevere that you have selected? Why, yes. Guinevere. This is her story. Your story. But not quite the one the legends remember. Chapter 1, the woman who would be queen. A scourging heat rises all around you, sourceless flames closing in as a crackling fills your ears. Where am I? You try to peer through the flames, but all you can make out are the armored silhouettes around you, figures clashing in some awful battle. Oh no, no. Your heart is torn between the urge to see more and a sudden fear of what you might find. Please, what is happening? What is this? Dread seizes your heart as a voice calls out your name. Guinevere, is everything all right? You shake your head to clear it, and as the flames in your mind's eye fade, you see your room in a humble kingdom of Carmeline. Servants bustle around packing your belongings into chests. Yes, father, I, I was just thinking that I'll miss this place terribly. Your father, King... Leodragrantz waves the last of his servants out before turning to smile sadly at you. As I will miss you, my dear, it means more than I can say that you've accepted Camelot's offer of betrothal. You make it sound as though I have a choice. You speak the words calmly, but your father's shoulders slump as he looks at the packed chests around the room. I wish there had been another way, but with the bandits, rebel kings, still testing the fragile peace or across the realm, our kingdom needs this alliance with Camelot's ruler. A permanent one. I understand. I will do what I must to keep our home safe. The betrothal was our best hope of protecting Carmelide. I have made my peace with that. I'm trying to, at least. My brave daughter, always wise beyond her years, your mother would be so proud if she could see you now. Your father takes your hand and squeezes it. I hope that fate smiles on your marriage and brings you true happiness. Now come, I wish to show you something. As your father leads you into a nearby dressing room, you think of the strange feeling from the moments before the rising flames. Perhaps if I'm lucky, the fates will show me what's in store. The moment that thought hits you, your vision suddenly swims again. Just as it did when you saw the flames, it's a familiar feeling, one you've known for as long as you can remember. What is it this time? Everything feels more vivid, full of potential, as you see a moment that has yet to come. You watch your father turning as he says something to you, the words hard to make out as strange currents buzz in your ears. But as he reaches towards the room's wardrobe, his arm brushes a decorative vase. Before you can move to stop it, the vase shatters on the ground. Mother's favorite vase. You blink and suddenly you're back in the present. You press a hand on the side of your head, sitting yourself as the vision fades. Was, that was this room, and Father was standing almost exactly where he is. I wanted you to have another piece of home to take with you. So I asked the tailors to prepare something special. Your father turns towards the wardrobe, and it's like you've seen double. Or deja vu. His arms move, just as you saw before, towards the vase. Reach out the stum. Father, look out! You grab his sleeve and pull him away, but the motion bumps him into the vase's stand. You watch helplessly as the vase wobbles and tumbles to the ground, shattering just as you saw in the vision. Oh, no, I'm, I'm so sorry, my dear. I know that was your mother's favorite. It's all right. What's done is done. I know I've never stopped a vision from happening before, but I had to try, for mother's sake. If only I could tell father. But if words of my visions ever got out, I'd likely be branded a witch. 
despite being king of all Carmelite, your father kneels to pick up the pieces of the boss himself, carefully setting them aside. I'll see if I can find a glass blower to repair it, but I still owe you a gift. He opens the wardrobe and pulls out a beautiful gown covered in lush embroidery. Oh, father, that must have taken the tailor's weeks to make. They agree that it was worth every stitch. You deserve to impress your betrothed, my dear, and all of Camelot when they meet the woman who is to become their king queen. I'm in choice, new beginnings, face your new life, and the kingdom's finest. Hmm. It's perfect. You do a twirl in your new dress, earning an affectionate laugh from your father, and then pull him into a hug. It means the world to have... to take a piece of home to take with me. And I suppose there's no putting it off any longer. Would you allow an old man to walk you to the gates one last time? I would insist on it. Servants, nobles, commoners gather around the gates of Carmelite's keep as your father escorts you to a cluster of mounted guards. Travel safely, my dear, and whatever you face in your new home, never forget that you are the princess of Carmelide, and never let them forget it. I won't. With your guards beside you, you ride for days down dusty roads, more peaceful than you've been since your childhood, bustling with other riders. These roads were barely safe to walk on during our old King Uther's reign. I've never seen so many travelers. Hi, Your Majesty. Things have changed for the better since his hair was crowned. My betrothed truly seems to make a difference across the realm. But a few hours ride from your destination, your horse suddenly stumbles, whining with alarm. What's wrong, girl? You dismount, and one of the guards examines the horse as she huffs, favoring one leg. Your horse seems to have thrown a shoe, your highness. She could still walk, but not at this pace. Oh, then we must make the best pace we can. I'm expected at Camelot before nightfall. You price on, agonizingly slow, but finally you see it. A shining city on a hill. <laughs> Only the water was moving. Besides the faint leaves. You know, it'd be nice. Camelot. It's like something out of a dream. As you ride your limping horse towards the walls, the distant gates open. A figure rides out with a glittering procession in their wake. As they spur their horse down the road, nearly leaving the procession in the dust, a crown glints upon their head. Choose! I'm assuming this would be King Arthur. I could be wrong. Right. Oh, we can get a queen. But, of course. Guess we'll go with number one. Don't even get to customize his hair or anything. The crowned man reins his horse in beside yours, looking at you with the brightest smile you've ever seen. Hey, if we can pick a female love interest, um, that would be Arthur. Could we pick a male Guinevere? I know, thinking outside the box. So we finally meet, Princess Guinevere. I'm King Arthur. Your betrothed. He beams at you, his posture regal, but his expression warmer and more open than you ever expected to see on a king. Nice. His gaze travels across your gown, admiration clearly in his eyes as he reaches for your hand and gallantly kisses it. I've been looking forward to your arrival all week, but I must admit your advisor's letter hardly did you justice. You're even more radiant than they said. Your Majesty. And you're even more becoming than the stories about you. He smiles, and the expression lights up his features like the sun. You've watched plenty of nobles and royals smile politely at compliments, but he seems genuinely flattered. They give me so much, uh, far too much credit. But I'm glad my appearance pleases you. We'll see a great deal of each other, after all, and I am glad to see you uh, here in one piece. When did you d did not arrive at the expected hour? I grew worried. Worried enough to nearly leave your guards behind. An old man rides up beside Arthur with the rest of the procession, his kindly features crinkled with concern. Is that... Merlin, yes. 
Princess Guinevere. Allow me to introduce Merlin, my court wizard and most trusted advisor. It's a pleasure to meet you. The elderly wizard bows as graciously as he can in his saddle. He gives your gown an approving nod. You as well, your highness, if first impressions are anything to go by, you look quite worthy of our king. But the delegation from Orkney is waiting to speak to you, Arthur, and so I advised sending a steward to find the princesses instead of rushing out here like a wild hare. I'm well aware of the Orkney delegation, Merlin, but you cannot blame me for wanting to ensure my bride-to-be's safety. And she deserves the finest welcome I can give, no matter who else must wait. My horse lost a shoe upon the road. It slowed our journey down. I hope I have not caused too much trouble. Arthur shakes his head, his smile reassuring. I may have caused a little, but I would gladly do so again. I have the royal farrier attend to your mare when we reach the castle, but until then, he dismounts and gallantly offers a hand to help you atop his own steed. Thank you, your majesty. It is kind of you to come all this way. He climbs back into the saddle behind you with ease, smiling gently. Even now that I know you are safe, you should not have to face your new home alone. And to be honest, I was eager to meet you. There's a sudden roaring in your ears as the world around you changes. You watch, horrified as the shining walls before you are engulfed by flames. Another vision? The flames I felt before, that was this. The heat claws at you as you survey the broken, burning battlefield that was once Camelot as the Arthur lying amidst the devastation, bleeding and struggling to raise his sword. He addresses an unseen foe, the pain of his wounds twisting his features. I beg you, do not do this. You cannot hear the answer over the rushing in your ears, but Arthur shakes his head. He gets his teeth as his grim expression melts into one of determination. No, I will not yield. But, just as suddenly as it swept over you, the vision fades. Camelot's walls are intact, Arthur is staring at you unharmed with concern in his eyes. Princess, are you well? I can't tell him. He'll think me mad. I am... rather tired from the journey. He's arrived to taste a bit of truth in the lie. I've come a very long way. I completely understand. Even the most pleasant of journeys does exact a toll. I shall try to get you to your new home as quickly as possible. He gestures ahead and his horse prances a little beneath both of you. Shall we? Merlin falls in with the other riders and with Arthur's arms for steadying you in his saddle. You ride through the streets lined with the king's subjects. Three cheers for our king! Three cheers for Princess Guinevere! Look at her dress, it's so elegant! The jolt, you realize these will soon be your subjects. The thought should fill you with excitement or even trepidation. But all I can think about is that vision. You've had visions all your life, nothing like this. The heat of the flames, the carnage, Arthur bloodied and broken, the high images haunt you. Everything here was utterly destroyed. What could possibly bring down all of Camelot? You look around for signs of danger, see Arthur casting curious, concerned glances at you. Perhaps there's some threat he may know about, unless asking will only worry him more. Your Majesty... Arthur, please, not your Majesty or King or anything of that sort. Just Arthur. Very well, just Arthur. I'm curious. Your people seem very fond of you. He smiles fondly as he surveys the gathered crowd. The measures of a decent king is the happiness of his people. It's a heavy responsibility, but a one I gladly accept for their sakes. A noble sentiment, both kind and wise. A group of children jump in place. Calling out your attention, you wave, smiling when their faces light up. I must say, I'm gratified to see you receive such a warm welcome from my people. They already seem quite taken with you. A sign of their good tastes, surely. I'll not argue with that. He seems so decent. How could someone wish to harm him or this place? Because the world's a cruel place. Get over it. Ah, here we are. 
You're torn from your reverie as you approach the most breathtaking castle you've ever seen. Its towers glittering in the sun. Arthur climbs down from the horse and helps you dismount, then gallantly offers you his arm. Welcome to your new home. There are just a few more people you should meet. He leads you through a heavy set of doors. And into the chamber of the legendary round table. For a moment, all thoughts of your terrible vision vanish as you take in the figure seated around it. Nice. The round table. If I remember the stories right, these knights must be... Mm -hmm. Trust Arthur to keep us waiting. Trust our king to know the importance of properly greeting his future wife. Ahem. <clears throat> the knights jump to their feet. Your majesty. Our, and our future queen. How you doing, Addy? I, I see under all that long hair. <laughs> Each knight presses a fist over their heart and bows deeply to you. It's an honor to finally meet you, your highness. The honor is mine. Yo, you grace this chamber with your beauty as you will undoubtedly grace this kingdom. Don't mind the tall one there. Kai is always grumpy. I am not grumpy. Be gentle, sir. Yavin. Arthur smiles and claps Kai on the shoulder. Or Kay. My foster brother may be serious, but he was the first of my knights. He's always been among the most loyal. Kay bows to you as Arthur turns to the other knights. Now, the wedding may be in two weeks' time, but I bid you all to treat Princess Guinevere as if she was already your queen. It will be an honor. Thank you all. I look forward to getting to know you beyond your legends. If you have time for a story. Oh no. Not now, Gawain. Fine, fine, maybe later. Right, settle down. There will be enough time to talk of legends tonight at the welcome feast I've arranged to honor our future queen. The Princess Guinevere. To the feast! The knights cheer and begin to chatter amongst themselves, Arthur smiles. They'll be doing that for a while, but if I may steal a word with my betrothed... Of course. He pulls you into a quiet alcove, his smile giving way to grave earnestness. Guinevere, I know you accepted this betrothal out of uh, duty as I did. Other kingdoms need this alliance. I'm well aware. But that doesn't mean this betrothal, this marriage, can be... Uh, has to be an unhappy one. It is my dearest wish that you come to consider Camelot your home, and I will do everything in my power to make you happy here. Your Majesty. Your company has made that far more likely than I expected. Pleasure lights up his face as he takes her hand in his. Instead of simply lifting it to his lips, he lingers for a moment, his thumbs brushing the backs of your fingers. You honor me, Princess. You honored me first with that welcoming party. He laughs and kisses the back of your hand, his lips warm. I'm glad my company has been a comfort to you. In fact, perhaps I could give you a personal tour of the castle now, for speaking from experience is less daunting once you get your bearings. And it would be a true pleasure to show you some of my favorite spots. You can't forget what you saw earlier, but this is your home now. Whatever fate awaits, there's no changing that. It would be lovely to see more of this place if I'm to spend the rest of my days here. I'd be honored to take that tour. Diamond choice. You push the thoughts of what you've seen to the back of your mind, then smile warmly at Arthur. The honor is mine. If he offers you his arm and begins to lead you through Camelot's fine halls. You marvel at the stonework and rich furnishings as he points out the various rooms. We could spend days walking these halls, but I will try to spare you the dollar parts. Over there, you see that staircase in the corner? The one with the mysterious flickering torches? That leads up to Merlin's Tower. He's often there raiding old tomes or seeking magical ways to defend Camelot. Though it's best not to visit unless he's expecting you. He can be rather... serious? Prickly. I see. I shall try not to run afoul of your prickly wizard. 
He leads you through an armory, just staring at the swords and axes on display. As you can tell, we have quite a collection. That's an understatement. Some of the weapons clearly are ceremonial, gilded with encrusted jewels, but there are plenty of more of utilitarian pieces as well. Tell me, have you been in many battles? He nods, his expression suddenly tinged with sadness. Eh, far more than I would have liked, but even kings who hope for peace must often forge it with their sword. I am thankful every day to have my knights in Excalibur to protect me. He passes a sheath and aside. A true warrior king should never be parted from his legendary blade. You gasp as Arthur guides you into the hall with soaring ceilings and ornate statues lining the walls. This is beautiful. This is the Grand Hall. This is where most of our feasts are held, including the one tonight in honor of your highly anticipated arrival. This place is wonderful, but... How will I ever find my way around? This is twice the size of my castle I grew up in. I know exactly what you mean. I often get lost in the early days, but uh, just after my coronation. Once I wound up in the kitchens where the millers scolded me for lazing around. No, oh, what did you do? Unloaded half a dozen of sacks of grain before the head cook recognized me and intervened. He chuckles at the memory and you join him. Thankfully, the halls become easier to navigate with experience. I hope you're right. Now, I save the best for last. There's more? <laughs> Only my favorite part of the entire castle. It leads you to a peaceful indoor garden. Sunbeams stream through the arched windows to dance across the flowers. It's very pretty. Gotta love nature. It's like something out of a dream. You wander through the flower beds with Arthur by your side, brushing your fingers over the velvety petals of a yellow flower. This is the first place in the castle that felt like home to me. The garden? I didn't know the legendary Arthur had a green thumb. <laughs> I wouldn't give myself that much credit. Growing up with my foster father, Sir Hector, I had many small responsibilities. Chores? Exactly. I spent many happy days of my youth tending the castle's garden. The peace here reminds me of those simpler times. You look out of the windows, your beautiful surroundings towards the distant home you left behind. I think I understand the feeling. I used to come here in search of solitude when the pressures of my new crown grew too heavy to bear. I still do. And no one interrupts your reveries? Rarely, although the garden is meant for anyone in the palace to use. Few do's. Out of difference to their king, I imagine. He laughs, softly. Just so. But I do hope. I hope that you will visit whenever you wish, to enjoy the peace I've hoarded for so long. He turns a corner, beckoning for you to follow, and gestures to a cluster of flowers you immediately recognize. Spring Lily. I know these spring lilies are native to Carmelide. I had them planted in advance of your arrival. I thought perhaps something familiar might stave off homesickness. He smiles at you, his eyes full of something you hardly expected to find here. Sympathy. I hope this garden can help Camelot begin to feel like a home for you, as it once did for me. Arthur... This means more than I can say. I've barely been here an hour, and you've done so much to welcome me to your home. It is our home, now, and it's nothing less than you deserve. Thank you for allowing me to show you uh, a small piece of Camelot. It has been a privilege, and if it's not too forward of me to say, quite enjoyable. He bows graciously, and when he straightens, his face is lit up with a radiant smile once again, earnest and hopeful. I knew so little about my future queen before today, but now that we've met, I look forward to learning even more. As I look forward to getting to know my future king. You extend your hand with an inviting glance, a pleased smile and curves his lips as he presses them to the back of your hand. How lucky that we are in agreement. He seems about to go on, but before he can speak, a servant rushes into the garden. Your Majesty, pardon the intrusion, but there's an urgent matter you must handle regarding tonight's guest list. Of course. 
if you'll excuse me for just a moment, Princess Guinevere. Go ahead. I'll try not to wander too far. As Arthur steps away to confer with the servant, you take one last look at the peaceful garden. Here's... He's been so welcoming. Loves this place could feel like home one day. If... If any of this lasts. But you can't forget the sight of the beautiful castle, drowning in flames. So she when a distant clash of swords reaches your ears. A fight? Is it happening already? First, it sounds like an echo of your vision from earlier, but as you follow the sound, you realize it's very real. You step into the courtyard where two knights spar with naked blades. One is a well-armored and on the defensive, but his opponent, who catches your eye. We're choosing knight one, two, three, four. I like your olive complexion, good sir. I shall go with you. Facing off against the armored knight, you see a devastatingly handsome man clad only in trousers, with a sword and a shield in hand. His muscles flex as an easy flick of his sword drives his opponent back. The strength of the blow seems effortless. Do you yield, brother? Never. He's fast. The armored knight swings again and your breath catches his opponent, deftly blocks with a shield. Come on now, don't be a sore loser. We'll see who's sore. The armored knight jerks a knife from his belt, flings at his opponent, but it sails wide, arching directly at you. Before you can move, the shirtless knight steps directly into the knight's path. Ah, but of course, very, very chiseled abs, if I may say so. Dude looks like Captain America. <laughs> Sorry. He's got the striped shield in the rear. Come on now. He usually knocks the knife aside with a shield and only sparring the briefest glance for his opponent before turning to you. The man bows his gaze, wandering over your dress with a frank admiration. I did not expect to find such a beautiful stranger in this dusty courtyard. And I didn't expect to find such a fierce battle. Are you all right, my lady? The knight sheaths a sword and gently takes it in your hand. It would grieve me if my opponent's carelessness had harmed you in any way. I'm grateful for your protection. You shouldn't have needed protection here. It glares at the armored knight who slinks away, looking ashamed. In all fairness, I'm the one who strayed too close to a sword fight. If he was unaware of your presence, then his shame is that much greater. I noticed you the moment you stepped into the yard. You did? Of course. I always notice two things above all else, danger and beauty. And which am I? His gaze flickers across you, intrigued and inviting all at once. Both, if I'm lucky. With obvious reluctance, he releases your hand, but his smile remains bold. In any case, I'm happy to have saved a lovely woman from such an untimely end. Yeah, no, listen, Ar Arthur would have killed all of you. Before you can answer, a familiar voice rings out across the courtyard. Lancelot, there you are. Lancelot is in... The knight turns to Arthur and raises a hand in greeting. My king, you've just missed a tremendous sparring match. A pity, but it appears Princess Guinevere has seen the whole thing. Princess. A Guinevere may I introduce the greatest knight in all the realm, and my best friend, Sir Lancelot du Lac. Oh, the boldness vanishes from Lancelot's face, and he drops to one knee. Y your Highness, I apologize for not recognizing you. If I showed you any disrespect. Be at ease, Sir Lancelot. You have nothing to apologize for. But I owe you more than an apology. I swore an oath to Arthur the day I became his knight. If you are to be my queen, I owe you the same loyalty. He draws a sword and lays it across his knee. His voice is somber, dutiful. But for some reason, he struggles to meet your eyes. Well, it's because a minute ago he was flirting with you. I vow to serve as your faithful knight so long as I live to honor and protect you with all my strength in my body. You open your mouth to speak just as the world seems to vibrate. Oh my god, this crap. And you're back in the same terrible vision. Camelot lies in ruins. 
as if that changed. Flames lick at the buildings and the sounds of battle swirl around you, swords clashing, people dying. Not again. Arthur is there, she saw him before, weak from blood loss, his arm shaking as he tries to raise his sword. I beg you, do not do this. Only this time you see the heartbreak in his eyes as the vision swirls. You see the sword raised to strike him down. No, please, no. And you see the man who holds it. I have to. Lancelot is bleeding too, blood streaming down his face from a mortal wound in his side. I have to for her. Lancelot raises a sword and the vision is consumed in fire and blood. Ah. Yes. Without further ado, that's it. Chapter 2 will be out shortly. Hopefully you all did enjoy. Please remember that if you did enjoy, to smack that like button. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, down in the description below the video is links. Tons of them. Feel free to check those out. Also, great ways to support the channel is to share the video. Share the channel. Bring more people into the fold. It's free. Literally, it's free. So consider doing that. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go get some honey for my voice now, um, as I've already been doing some videos that are on backlog that I'll be uploading here later today, um, as well as I still have Chapter 2 to do, and then um, the Phantom Agent in one hour. So, yeah, and still got Chapter 2 to do for today. Thanks for watching. Love your beautiful faces. Peace.